Why don't you all stand to your feet with me across this place? I'm gonna read the most famous Bible verse of all time. Right now, someone somewhere in the world has got a placard. They are in their lounge room with some paint and they are spraying with paint. These Bible verses that I am about to read to you, it's John chapter 3, verse 16. Every Olympic Games, every sporting event, concerts all around the world, there's gonna be someone with a sign that says John 3, 16. Most people have no idea what that means, but this is what it means. And we're actually gonna say this verse together this morning. Then I'm gonna preach for a while. Um, here we go, John chapter 3, verse 16. And uh, let's say this together. Can we do this together, church? For God so... Oh, well done. Give yourselves a round of applause. Grab a seat around this place. Grab a seat. You know, it's one thing. It is one thing to have nothing and want something and something entirely different to have achieved your dreams and still find that something is missing. This story today is actually based around the life of a man called Nicodemus. Nicodemus was upper middle class. Nicodemus was a successful businessman. Nicodemus was a successful politician. And having achieved all his dreams, he still found that something was missing. You've had a situation, a moment in your life where you realise something's missing? Something that maybe should have been there is not there? I remember when I was 15 and my family moved from Australia. We moved to Manchester. My dad was a pastor. He was preaching at a church in a place called Gorton. How many of you know Gorton? My dad parked the car outside this church. We did Sunday night church. And after the Sunday night service, we walked back out to where we thought the car was, but something was missing. Come on, if you're from Gorton, give me a wave across this place. You know what I'm talking about. Something was missing. Or, or maybe, maybe you've had a situation like Sophie and I have had uh, when we used to live in Sheffield. We came home one night, we picked up a friend from, from Manchester Airport, we drove back to Sheffield, and as we walked into our, our house, we knew that something was missing. There was something in the air, there was something in the atmosphere. As we looked around, we, we realised that some things that were there were not there, something was missing. The thing that was missing was the back door. As the burglars had decided to come in, something was missing. Sophie and I have been married for 22 years. Today she's preaching in a place called Oswald Twistle. It's a good place, isn't it? Near Accrington, up that way somewhere. And, and Sophie and I, for 22 years of marriage, Sunday has been the busiest day of the week for us. We're up early, 5.30, I do a morning workout, I have a prayer time, I read my Bible, I prepare, I get ready, looking this good takes hours of work, get to church, usually preach, meet people in the foyer, listen to people, talk to people, preach, lead, think about the service, think about afterwards, think about next thing, I'm always thinking about next year, and then somewhere in the journey, we ended up with two cars and, and also two children, our children, by the way. And, uh, and, and, and it's happened three times since we've been in Audacious Church Manchester, where my wife has come at a different time to meet at church. Uh, I've gone home after my wife has gone home. I get home, I, I have a shower, I get changed. Is there anything better than a tracksuit track suit on a Sunday afternoon, my friend, and you know, sitting down about to have lunch? And, and all of a sudden, we realise that something is missing. As we get a phone call from Pastor Hannah again saying, uh, Glenn, so um, your kids are still at church. What's the plan? <laughs> I think the first time that happened, my son was about three and my daughter was about six. And we just, she went home and left them here with me and I went home, completely forgot that they were here. Something <laughs> was missing. Here we have in the Bible a moment where an upper middle class successful businessman who's got more money than he knows really what to do with, though there's always a yearning for more, he's successful in politics. He arrives at a station at a, at a season in life where he's got everything, but still something is missing. <laughs> 18 months ago, I was at a football club and I was in the hospitality box 
which was next to the owner's hospitality box. I was invited there by a friend and I sat around a table and the, around the table were, was about seven or eight billionaires sitting around the table from different parts of the world. And the conversation was a fascinating conversation as we tucked into some fresh sushi prepared by the chef there. And I love sushi, so I'm enjoying eating the food. And I've got to be honest, I was slightly intimidated by the conversation as they talked about how many cars they had, how many yachts they had, where their latest villa in Switzerland or, or France was. And they talked about lots of different things. And honestly, it was a privilege to sit there and listen to how the 0.0000001% of the world live. And, and I had really no contribution to this conversation, just, just listening to what was going on. And there was a pause. And when the pause happened, I leaned forward. I said, yeah, but yeah, guys, tell me, how are your families? And it was like a, a tumbleweed moment as tumbleweed kind of blew through that, that boardroom, that hospitality room, as one man started to talk about another relationship that he was in and another one talked about a son who he loved, but really didn't know how to show love to his son. And he knew that through his lifestyle, he was pushing his son further and further away. And the conversation naturally came to a point where they all recognised and we recognised together that in life, we all reach moments like Nicodemus, where it feels like something is missing. I wonder if I could take you back to the beginning of John chapter three. We read John chapter three, verse 16, but I wanna read you the first opening four verses, the first four parts of this story. <coughs> now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council, a politician. He came to Jesus at night. He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you. I don't know if you've noticed this, if ever you've read the King James Version, the old translation, the old English version of the Bible, Jesus says words like verily, verily, or verily, truly. The actual phrase there in the original language is our word, amen. Now, usually when we pray, we say amen at the end of a prayer, it means so be it. But in this context, Jesus starts talking. He says, amen, I tell you. And really the power of what he's saying is this. His amen literally means this. He's saying from firsthand experience, I can tell you. This is what you would say in a court of law. As the judge and the jury would sit presiding over a case, you as an eyewitness, when you were giving evidence, you would start by saying, verily, verily, or verily, truly. In other words, as a personal eyewitness of this, I can tell you this, and this stands up in a court of law. So Jesus is saying, amen, from firsthand experience, I tell you, no one can see the Kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, I don't know what your journey with God is for the many people watching live online now as well. You may have heard the phrase, a born again Christian. The phrase born again Christian comes from Jesus' words here in John chapter three. Jesus is saying, unless you are born again, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Amen, verily, truly, from first-hand experience, I tell you, no one can enter the Kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. For flesh gives birth to flesh. A woman gives birth to a child, but the Spirit of God gives birth to the Spirit of a man or a woman. What I find fascinating with this Scripture here is this, is the Bible says that Nicodemus went to Jesus at night. The reason he went to Jesus at night was because he was embarrassed. He was unsure of what people would think if they saw him going to church. And so going to talk to Jesus. And so he went undercover. He went in disguise so nobody would see him. Can I just pause at this moment and say to everybody here, it's okay to go to God undercover. It's okay when you're driving your car, when you're in the shower, when nobody sees, when nobody knows. It's okay for you to go to God and say, God, if you are real, 
then I need to prove yourself to me. If you are real, God, I need you to show yourself to me. He went undercover. And, 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 and what I love about Nicodemus here is that Nicodemus was surprised with the response that he got from Jesus. Can I say this? God is always surprising. The God of the Bible is not what you think. He's not what you thought. He is not what you imagined. He is the God of great surprise. And certainly in this passage in John chapter three, Nicodemus, this upper middle class, this businessman, this successful politician was surprised when Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus didn't understand that even today as many people don't understand that phrase. But what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus was this. He's saying, Nicodemus, are you open to the possibility of something that is out of the ordinary? That's effectively what he's saying. And I wanna ask you, Audacious Church, the same question today. Are you open to the possibility of there being something out of the ordinary? Because this is exactly what Nicodemus had to be open to in order for something to change, in order for him to get the very thing that was missing in his life. Jesus lands on this phrase, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the reason Jesus stops there and He says these words to Nicodemus and ultimately to us in 2018 in central Manchester is because Jesus wants you and I to know several things. The first reason why Jesus says this verse in John 3, 16 is because He wants to dispel some myths about God. Did you hear me? He wants to dispel some myths about God. You see, it doesn't matter what you thought God was like. The Bible says God is love. I mean, I guess we learn things about God through our upbringing. We learn things about God by going to church, the way we're treated maybe by Christians or or by pastors. We learn things about God by watching the Passion of the Christ or other such Hollywood blockbusters. We learn things about God through what our parents tell us. And it's amazing how we reach a station in life where we can feel like we understand who God kind of is. Just a few months ago, uh, Linz and I are doing a Masters of Leadership, aren't we? Because we're intelligent like that, Linz. And uh, I had to do a question. I did a questionnaire to a high school in Middleton, a yeah, secondary school, took 280 high school students. And one of the questions is, who is God? And out of 280 people, got somewhere in the region of 146 different responses. People who'd reached a place where they felt, we felt like we, we know God. And so Jesus says, for God so loved, in order to dispel some myths about who God really is, about what God is really, really like. You see, the thing I've noticed about God is this, is that God in 2018 in Manchester, He's ignored in good times and blamed in bad times. In central Manchester in 2018, uh, God is a, is a swear word used by those who deny His existence, but still use His name as a swear word. God is used by insurance companies when they have a label called an act of God. I think I told you about this on a few occasions, but you know what? We have a new trampoline in our back garden and now I have anchored it to the ground. Not only have I anchored it to the ground six times, but I've also anchored it to the fence because our previous trampoline got picked it up, but picked up in a storm, blew over the fence onto my neighbour's Mercedes Benz and the insurance company says, we're not paying out. It is an act of God. So I said to the insurance broker, I said, what God? (laughs) And why does He wanna ruin my trampoline, my kid's trampoline and my neighbor's car? People got crazy concepts about God. He's linked, God is linked with tragedy as though it proves His non-existence. And the worst thing of all is when preachers like me use the term God's judgment 
as an arbitrary term to define what God is up to. And yet John 3.16 is given to you and I by Jesus, the Son of God Himself, to dispel every myth so that you can know once for all that God is love. The God of heaven and earth, the God of the Bible, He is a God of love. Why does bad stuff happen to good people? That's a sermon I preached last year that you can scroll through our podcasts and get. But God is a God of love. Hey folks, I wonder if it's okay. Can I, can I show you an image of love? What does love look like? It's more than a feeling. What does love look like? Have a look at this picture here right now. That's what love looks like. That's Steve and Tara. We saw their two little chunky babies being dedicated a moment ago. But when you know the story, when you hear Tara's journey and Steve's journey and the journey to get to this point and the miraculous hand of God, you just gotta scroll through Tara's feed. Love, love. that's what love looks like. Church, the reason I put that up there today is to show you how God looks at you. For God so loved you. I'm sorry, you thought He was angry? No, for God so loved. Sorry, you thought He was judgmental? No, no, for God so loved. Sorry, you thought He was upset or disappointed or dismayed with you? No, 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 for God so loved the world. That's the image of love that we see. I think that's what I hear when I read the words, for God so loved, it's God saying, I got you. I got your back, whatever you're walking through, whatever you're in the middle of, God says, God says, I got you. And the thing about love is this, is love is something that we have to be open to and embrace because it's one thing for God to love us. It's another thing for us to receive that love. And so Jesus says, for God so loved in order for us to understand that, that we needed to have our myths about God dispelled. If I was the devil, I would tell you God doesn't love. I would tell you God's judgmental. I'd tell you God's angry. I'd tell you God's mad. But I want you to know the God of the Bible is a God who says, I love that face. I got your back. You're beautiful. The second reason in John chapter 3, 16, why Jesus speaks these words is He does it in order to define love for us. He does it in order to define love. Georgia, I wonder if you and Amy and the others can come up there. Olu, you can come up as well. And Dorcas, join me on stage. Uh, yeah, a message, uh, an illustration that I used early last year. But the Bible says in, in Ephesians chapter 3, 17 to 19, it says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love, Love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, all academic thinking. You can't prove it with a good book. You can't prove it with a convincing argument that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I love this, that you may together be able to grasp the measurements of God's love. Really, what the Bible's saying here is this, if we were to get every person in the life of Audacious Church, Manchester and Chester and now a Bury as well, and we would all get together and give our own opinion on what we think about God's love, it wouldn't even come close to truly defining the indescribable depths of the love of God. If we were to take every theologian, every sage of the age, every great scholar, what they've written about the love of God, it's still like like trying to grasp water. You can't really catch it. How do you fully understand the love of God? Well, in Ephesians, in the verses we just read, he has a good chance, a good attempt. He says that you may know that God's love is wide. In other words, he wants you to know that God's love is timeless. It, it started before time began. And even when time finishes, His love will still remain. God, with His arms out wide, reaches everyone in ages past, everyone in the future to come, and He encompasses us all with His love. 
just like I used to do. When my kids were little, I'd come home from traveling and I'd get down on my knees and my arms would be open and Georgia and Jaden would run. And I want you to know, every single time my arms managed to wrap around both of them and Sophie too. That's what God's love is like. That you may know His love is long. In other words, it's endless. By the way, that's my daughter. That's Georgia. At 1.30 today, she has a driving lesson. Just here in central Manchester. Can I just suggest you all stay for donuts for the next two hours? I just wanna say I love you, baby, but this is good. His love is endless. His love has no beginning, no end. Uh, the Bible's saying His love is, is high, it's limitless, it has no ceiling. And the Bible says His love is deep, it has no bottom to it. In other words, what the Bible wants you to understand is this, is that all the days of your life, whether you receive it or not, you are in the middle of God's love. And it doesn't matter where you go, it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter how low you go. It doesn't matter how evil you get. It doesn't matter how greedy and ignorant of God you get. The Bible says that at, at all times, you are in the middle of God's love. For God so loved the world. We understand through this that He's trying to dispel myths, but also He's letting you know, He's defining love, that love is an action. God's love is so great that He gave. Love gives, love demands an action. He defines an action in Jesus' Name. The third thing Jesus wants you to know through this passage in the Bible, thanks to you for, you can walk off right now, is He wants you to know that love demands the best. Which is why it says that He gave His only Son. You know, a few weeks ago when I was in California and my son and I, we literally ran into a bear. When I say ran into a bear, we parked our car, we walked 20 yards this way, we stopped, we looked back that way and there was a bear stood next to our rental. On all fours, it came up to my shoulders and the thought that I had is this, do I run quicker than my son or do I fight the bear? <laughs> of course, love demands, Jaden, you go. I'll see you in heaven, son. <laughs> love demands the best. In order for me to love my wife, I can't dress in nice clothes while she dresses in rags. Love demands the best. And in the same way that my wife is my bride, the Bible says that the church is the bride of Christ. And so the reason that God the Father did not send an angel or an intern, the reason He sent His Son was to let you know that love demands the best. Do you, do you remember, you remember the game, don't you? Remember this? She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. Her name is Kelly. I was 13. This was my second love. My first love was my year four teacher, Miss Scarlett. <laughs> I prayed every day that God would cause Miss Scarlett to wait for me, that I could marry her one day. I'm so glad God said no, because if He said yes right now, I'd be married to an 84-year-old woman. <laughs> but then when my first real love came along, Kelly at the age of 13, she looked at me, she loves me. She ignored me at church today, she loves me not. She sat next to me in church, she loves me. <laughs> She's hanging out with my best mate, she loves me not. <laughs> it's funny, we, we play this game. I played it as a 13 year old boy. Of course, the good thing about this game is this, is I could get to the end wherever I was and go, she loves me. <laughs> I mean, it's a stupid game, isn't it, that we all play. I guess we played it as a kid. The trouble is this, many Christians do it with God. I feel good, He loves me. I feel sad. God, where are you? He loves me not. I got a pay rise, He loves me. My job sucks, He loves me not. 
And we can play this game based on the way we think and and the way we feel. But the reason that Jesus says, for God so loved that He gave His one and only Son is so that we may know, Romans chapter 8, verse 38 to 39, for I am convinced, baby, I am convinced. I know deep down in my Noah, I, I know, I know deep down, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Why? Because in the way we play this silly little game, God the Father says, hang on a minute. I said my best. I, 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 didn't, I didn't come to you with second best. I didn't come to you with a failed attempt. I didn't come to you with, with, with a love that comes and goes. It's up and down. It waxes and wanes. No, no, I gave you my best. Folks, would you stand to your feet with me across this place? I want to take you old school right now. Olu and Dorcas are going to take us old school. I want to take you back into the 17... 1800s, where a hymn was written. And this hymn really defines, I think, encapsulates for us the fact that what God did through the verses of John 3.16 is this, is that He gave us His best. Can I speak to all the Audacious Church family for a moment and say this, the reason we come to church early, the reason we connect with each other, the reason we tithe, the reason we lift our hands in worship, the reason we're so excited in the house of God is because we're responding to the one who gave His best. I mean, how average and lame would it be for my wife to give me a gift, but for me to just sit there, arms folded and go, oh, it's nice. And yet I guess sometimes Christians can do that with the one who sent his best. So we're going old school. Everyone say old school. You probably sang this if you went to a Church of England school. You probably sang this if you are in your 40s, probably. You probably know this song. Maybe you've sung it at weddings, funerals, bar mitzvahs, I don't know. But the words are gonna come up on screen and I would love for you to maybe sing this song with us because I think it perfectly encapsulates this God who demands the best. Thanks, Dorcas. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prayer of glory die my riches gain I count by Lord and poor content on Oh, thoughts composed 
so rich a crowd where the sing together with the whole realm. Where the whole realm of nature Demands my soul. Demands my soul. My heart, my own. With every head bowed and every eye closed across this auditorium, if you can just remain on your feet for a moment. If you're watching online right now, you can respond in this moment as well. But maybe you're here in church and This is either your first time or you've come many, many times. And you've been on a journey of connection with God, a a spiritual journey of sorts, maybe like Nicodemus. You kind of reached a station in life where you have everything, but still something's missing. Maybe you're that first case where you've got nothing and want something, but you find yourself here in church today. And in the same way that we read a moment ago, Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh, so spirit gives birth to spirit. The Bible teaches us that when we're not walking in relationship with God, that what God does is He literally knocks on the door of our heart. The book of Revelation, Jesus says, I'm knocking on the door. I wanna come in and I wanna have relationship with you. And maybe you're here in this moment, you're saying, Glenn, I actually don't know Jesus. You may have been christened as a child, but honestly, you don't know Jesus. And whatever your journey has been on, I want you to know that over the last 10, 11 years of Audacious Church, around 10 and a half thousand people have joined this moment and lifted their hands and said, Glenn, I don't know Jesus, but just where I'm standing, would you include me in this prayer? Because Jesus is knocking on the door of my heart. And I recognise that the thing that's missing is a relationship with God. And I wanna include you in this prayer. I'm not gonna embarrass anybody but I do wanna include you in a prayer just where you're standing. So with nobody looking around, guys. At the end of the service, for those of you who respond in this moment, I wanna give you a free Bible that you can take home to help you on your journey of connectivity with God. But if that's you, you're saying, Glenn, would you include me in this prayer? I'm away from God, I don't know Jesus. But I wanna take a step forward in my heart right now by responding to the love of God. I wanna know God. That I'm gonna count to three. And after I get to three, I just want you to lift your hand for a moment. You'll be able to drop your hand down again. Then I'm gonna pray a prayer from the front. So if that's you, you're saying, Glenn, please include me in this prayer. I wanna know Jesus. I wanna receive the love of God in my life. I wanna know Him. I'm gonna ask you to lift your hand after three. Here we go. One, two, Three. Right now, would you quickly lift your hand nice and high across this place? Would you keep it up for me? Thank you, 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 thank you.